Estonian universities. Professor Bagheria seems to work in the most fundamental of mathematical areas, both the theory and the mathematical. Uh, he seems to go beyond the established standard structure of set theory and uh, so taught his title large cardinals and set theory and, and beyond. Professor Bagheria. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. It's a real pleasure to be speaking here uh, in Kerala, even though from a distance. But anyway, I'm very happy to be speaking here about set theory. So uh, this is a talk, an introductory talk to set theory and most specifically to the theory of large cardinals, which is a central area in set theory. Uh, so I will just give a few ideas uh, of what large cardinals are, what is large cardinal theory, and then I will just give a few examples uh, of applications to other areas, and I will finish with some uh, rather recent results on a, using a particular kind of large cardinal um, that uh, has produced uh, several interesting new results in recent years. So. Let me begin. <clears throat> what is a large cardinal? Well, a large cardinal, it's a, uh, when we say something is a large cardinal, what we mean, it's, a, it's an uncountable cardinal number, which has some properties that uh, imply that it is very large. It's so large that one cannot prove it exists in the standard uh, system of set theory, the zermelo frankel set theory with the axiom of choice, ZFC. Why not? Well, because if such a cardinal exists, then this would imply the consistency of ZFC. It would imply the existence of models of the theory ZFC. And we know that this is impossible by good old second incompleteness theorem. Okay. If, if ZFC is consistent, which we hope and believe, then uh, uh, ZFC cannot prove its own consistency. So in particular, it cannot prove that such large cardinals exist. However, there is a very strong evidence that every natural mathematical statement, and by natural, I mean every mathematical statement that people are interested in. I mean, uh, I mean not a very uh, specifically designed statement to obtain you know, uh, paradoxes or self-referential statements like Gödel's uh, uh, sentences uh, that he used to prove the the second incompleteness theorem and so on. Okay, so I, uh, if you take any natural mathematical statement that is independent of ZFC, namely that you can neither prove it nor disprove it or refute it in ZFC, then it turns out that this statement is either equiconsistent with ZFC or with ZFC together with uh, the existence of a large cardinal, okay? Uh, equiconsistent means that the consistency of one implies the other and vice versa. So um, when we talk about the consistency strength of a, of a statement, a mathematical statement or, or a set theoretic statement, uh, then um, we mean the following. Okay, so if, if we have a statement that is not equiconsistent with ZFC, then we can measure how strong this statement is in terms of consistency by comparing it to large cardinal axioms. Uh, large cardinal axioms, I mean, axioms that assert the existence of a certain large cardinal. Mr. Bagheria, your uh, yes. slides, slides haven't moved yet. Is that a problem or you, have, you haven't moved it? The slides oh, are you don't, you don't see the change? No, no. You, have, you haven't seen a change at all. Oh, sorry. Let me start. Please. Let me, let me, ah. Uh, Appreciate it. Okay. Probably you should close let's it. Let's see. Uh, let's see. Okay. Let me, uh, that's strange. Yes. Uh, okay. No. Uh, now it is moving. No? Now, now can you try? It's moving. Uh, oh, it's not. It's not. No, Maybe you share again. Uh, now? Yeah, it's moving. Yeah, it's perfect. Yes. Yeah, now yeah. it's moving, but but when I put when I put the the full screen view, it's not. Yeah, let me try again. So how about now? Is it moving? No, no, no. No. So it's a problem with the full screen. Uh, okay, then I'll I'll I'm not gonna use full screen. Uh, 
Okay, I can do it like this. Is it okay? Yeah, yeah it's okay. Yeah. Is it okay like this? It's okay. Yeah, we can see it. Here. Yes. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. So, uh, you saw this one already, did you? No. No. Or not? No. <laughs> okay. So, sorry. Uh, so again, uh, this is what I said, uh, but that, that's just written here that um, that uh, large cardinals are uncountable cardinal numbers that are very large and we cannot prove they exist because they imply the consistency of ZFC and this cannot be because of Gödel's incompleteness. And however, there is uh, strong evidence that every natural mathematical statement is either equiconsistent with ZFC or with ZFC plus some axiom that says that such and such large cardinals exist, okay? And in this way, we can measure the strength of mathematical statements, because if you take a statement phi, uh, then um, either it's equiconsistent with ZFC, which means that uh, if ZFC is consistent, that this statement is also consistent, um, or there is some, large cardinal axioms, say A1 and A2, such that the consistency of your statement implies the consistency of A1 modulo CFC. And the other way, and uh, we have the other direction that the consistency of some large cardinal axiom implies the consistency of your statement. Now, uh, uh, we say that A1 is, is, a, is a lower bound for the consistency strength and uh, A2 is an upper bound. Okay, now when the upper bound and the lower bound coincide, then we have an exact measure of the consistency strength of your statement. Okay, I will give some examples. Let me, let me just uh, uh, start by uh, reminding you of some examples of large cardinals. Uh, those are early examples and I, I list here in chronological order. So the first large cardinal to be considered was the notion of weakly inaccessible. And this was uh, uh, defined by and studied by Hausdorff in 1908, so a long time ago. Uh, Tap is weakly inaccessible if it is regular, which means you cannot, um, you cannot reach up to it in less than kappa many steps. It's uncountable and it's a limit cardinal. Okay. Uh, we say it's inaccessible or strongly inaccessible if it's regular and countable and uh, not only a limit, but a strong limit. So which means that the, the power set operation on cardinals smaller than kappa uh, does never reach kappa. So when you apply the power set operation below kappa, you stay below kappa. And this was studied by Sierpinski and Tarski and Cervello in the 1930s. A very important large cardinal notion is that of measurable cardinal. And this uh, was also introduced by Ulam in 1930 as a result of his uh, study and so solution of the Lebesgue measure problem. Um, Cup is measurable if it is uncountable and there is a kappa additive non-trivial two-valued measure on the power set of kappa. Okay, in other words, if there is a, a, a non-trivial or non-principal ultra filter that, uh, that is kappa complete on the cardinal kappa. Uh, another important notion is that of a compact cardinal or strongly compact cardinal. And uh, this was introduced in 1961 by Erdos and Tarski. And uh, we say that kappa is compact if the compactness theorem holds for the infinitary logic L kappa kappa. So this is the first order logic in which you allow conjunctions and disjunctions of length less than kappa, and you allow to quantify over sets of variables of size less than kappa. So this logic, uh, the compactness of this logic, meaning that if it is, uh, uh, if you have a, a, a set of sentences that is, uh, uh, in which every subset of size less than kappa is satisfiable, then the whole set is satisfiable. Then um, if you have this compactness property for this logic, then kappa is uh, what is called a, a, a compact cardinal. Uh, another notion also introduced in the 60s, which uh, is a bit strange, 
And it doesn't look like it's talking about cardinals, but it is, uh, in fact. This is known as Vopenka's principle, um, and it just says that there is no rigid proper class of graphs. So if you have a class of graphs uh, that is a proper class, namely that um, it's not a set, so there are so many that it's a proper class, there are graphs of arbitrarily large size, then um, this class cannot be rigid, meaning that there must be some non-trivial morphism, so some morphism that is not the identity. Okay, graph, I mean, by morphism, I mean graph homomorphism. Okay, so these are just some, some uh, well-known classic notions of large cardinals. Uh, the large cardinals form, uh, uh, it's, very, it's a very rich, uh, a very rich uh, a family of, of uh, of cardinals in which there are many different notions of increasing strength. Uh, so this is just a, a, a diagram or a schema of some of the best known notions. You start with inaccessible, weakly compact and so on. I haven't talked about those. Here are the measurable ones. Uh, above are the strongly compact or compact, and then Popenka's principle is up here, and they're still stronger and stronger. Of course, the strongest uh, notion would be zero equals one, because this is false, and therefore it implies everything. So, so we're, the idea is that by, by uh, assuming or by asserting the existence of these cardinals that are stronger and stronger and stronger, eventually one reaches inconsistency. So one creates theory so strong that uh, it's, uh, eventually we'll be able to prove everything, at which point uh, you stop because then it's worthless, yes. Okay, just for the record, let me remind you what we mean by the universe of all sets. So the universe of all sets is uh, what is called the cumulative hierarchy. This was first described by John von Neumann in, in the 1930s. And uh, so uh, this is the, the sets uh, form these layers, right? And, uh, and they are generate, these layers are generated uh, from the ordinals. So at any stage alpha, you just take the power set of what you have up to this point of V alpha and you generate the V alpha plus one. Yes, when you reach a limit point, you just take the unions of the union of all the previous uh, layers, and the universe is just this whole thing generated in this way along the ordinals. Okay, so this is the universe of all sets, and this is uh, described. The properties of the universe are described by the zermelo frankel uh, axioms of set theory. Now, let's look at uh, some. Uh, equiconsistencies and equivalences of some statements with large cardinals. For example, if uh, the assertion that every co-analytic, so every complement uh, of, of an analytic um, uncountable set of real numbers contains a perfect set, this statement, okay? And the existence of an inaccessible cardinal are equiconsistent. So it means that if you have a model of set theory in which every quantalytic and countable set of real numbers contains a perfect set, then there is also a model in which there is an inaccessible cardinal. And vice versa, if you have a model in which there is an inaccessible cardinal, then you can get a model in which every quantalytic and countable set contains a perfect set. That's what we mean by equiconsistency. Okay, so you see this is interesting because inaccessible cardinals appear naturally when you start considering some very basic topological properties of sets of real numbers, rather simple sets, yes, a complement of, of an analytic set. Uh, for example, if you, um, the existence of a measurable cardinal is equiconsistent to the existence of an extension of the Lebesgue measure uh, to a countably additive measure that measures all sets of reals, okay? So uh, the ex this extension of the last measure is consistent uh, if and only if um, the existence of a measurable cardinal is consistent. And those, so those two uh, notions are equiconsistent. 
So here we see that inaccessible cardinals and measurable cardinals are equivalent system with some natural notions. And sometimes we, we uh, get not only equiconsistency, but actually equivalence. For example, the existence of an inaccessible cardinal is equivalent to saying that one of the layers of the universe, V kappa, is a model of ZFC. Yes. And for example, uh, the existence of a measurable cardinal is equivalent, not just equiconsistent, but equivalent to the existence of a cardinal kappa, such that when you look at the kappa product of the integers modulo finite, let's say, and we'll, you look at homomorphisms from this group, this ability group to the integers, then you just get the, the, the you, you can get a non-trivial one. Yes, so there is a non-zero non homomorphism from this group to the integers, even only if there is a measurable cardinal. So see, this is kind of surprising because this notion of measurable cardinal uh, turns out to be equivalent to some natural uh, property of uh, uh, products of a billion groups, in particular, this kind of groups. Okay, now most large cardinals are given by elementary embeddings. Um, for example, uh, a measurable cardinal uh, is given by the following property. Kappa is measurable even only if there is an embedding from the universe of all sets to some subuniverse uh, that is transitive, so it contains all elements of its elements, which is not the identity. And therefore, there is a critical point, namely there's the first ordinal that is moved by it, and that's called the critical point. And that critical point is the measurable part. I'll show you a picture here. That's the idea. So cap is measurable even only if you, you have such a situation. You have an embedding from the universe of all sets into some sub-universe. So I draw here on the right, but in fact, M is contained in B that has critical point kappa, okay? That kappa is the first ordinal, it's a cardinal that is moved, okay? It's called the critical point. Uh, other large cardinals can be also uh, like Popenka's principle. Remember, it just says that there is no rigid proper class of graphs, but it can also be uh, reformulated in terms of the existence of some elementary embeddings. Elementary means that truth is preserved. So something, yeah, in the case of measurable, so it means that if something is true here uh, about some objects here, then the same thing is true in M about the images of those objects and vice versa. Okay, it's a truth preserving map. Right, so uh, the, if you, uh, in principle, this M is smaller than the whole universe. And if you require that M is very much similar to V, then you get stronger and stronger notions of large cardinals. For example, if you require that M is closed under lambda sequences, then you get the notion of lambda supercompactness. And you say that cup is super compact if you have an elementary embedding as before, like in the case of measurables, but now you require that the image of the critical point, J of kappa is as big as you like, and the M, the model M is as close as you want, okay? So M is very close to V. And this is why you get a much stronger large cardinal notion called supercompactness. There are other notions like being extendable, which is uh, stronger than supercompact, and also can be formulated in terms of elementary embeddings. Now, not from the whole universe, but from some initial segment of the universe into some other, and so on. So the ultimate, the ultimate notion of this kind would be uh, what is called the Reinhardt cardinal, namely the a cardinal that is the critical point of an elementary embedding from the universe into itself. So in this case, M would be the whole universe V. Okay, this will be the most one could hope for. But such cardinals don't exist. This was shown by Kunin uh, in 1971. So this gives a, um, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the maximum. Uh, so th this gives you the limit of what you cannot achieve, right? So you cannot have such embeddings in which M is as big as possible. Such cardinals don't exist. 
In fact, you cannot have even an elementary embedding from some uh, initial initial segment of the universe uh, from that is of the form lambda plus two with lambda limit a limit uh, ordinal into itself. Okay. So the most one can hope is to have it from V lambda plus one into V lambda plus one. And this, we don't know if it's consistent. This is uh, one of the strongest uh, large cardinal notions that we don't know if they are consistent or not. Probably they are, but we don't know. Okay, so uh, large cardinals, let me just mention briefly this. Uh, one may wonder, okay, but Sure, you can invent all these properties of large cardinals and so on, but uh, why, why, why are these uh, principles uh, true? Or why should we believe such cardinals exist and so on? Okay, so that's, a, that's an important point. And uh, the answer is that large cardinals are in fact even though they are formulated in many different ways and they originate in many different settings, large cardinals are in fact uh, principles of reflection. And let me just briefly say what those are. Uh, so there is a phenomenon in the set theoretic universe that's called reflection. This was discovered in the 60s, uh, 1960s, namely that um, there are many cardinals kappa such that V kappa is a sigma n, uh, what is called the sigma n elementary substructure of the universe. Namely, that if you take any formula that has complexity sigma n, and this means that it has the form that it has n quantifiers alternating, starting with an existential one. Yes, so this measures the complexity of the formula. So if you take any formula of this bounded complexity, then, uh, this formula will be true of some objects in V kappa, even only if this is true also in, in the universe. Okay, so this is this is what it means that V kappa is a sigma n elementary substructure of the universe. So there are many kappa, if you fix an n, if you fix n, then there are many kappas, many levels of the universe that are know everything about the universe that has complexity sigma n or below. Yes, maybe not more, but uh, up to that point, those levels uh, know what is true about the universe. Okay? It is the reflection phenomenon. Now it turns out that if you require that there is such a kappa which is regular, which is a regular cardinal, that is the same as saying that kappa is inaccessible. So you see, uh, the existence of an inaccessible cardinal, even though you cannot prove it in ZFC, it's a very reasonable axiom because it just says that this phenomenon of reflection that happens at many kappas, it also happens at some kappa that is regular. Well, if you extrapolate this, then uh, you get all large cardinals. Actually, this is a phenomenon that has been recently been uh, uncovered and there are many recent results about this. So there is something called structural reflection. This is a notion I introduced some years ago. Uh, that says the following. Suppose you have a proper class of structures of any given type. So this could be a class of groups, a class of uh, uh, topological spaces, a class of whatever. I mean, some fixed class of structures of a certain kind, okay? So the structural reflection principle at kappa, it just says, that this cardinal kappa reflects this class, which means that if you take any structure in your class, no matter how big, no matter where it lives in the set theoretic universe, then you can always find another structure in your class, which is a small, it lives in V kappa, that looks very much like A, right? It looks very much means that there is an elementary embedding from the small one into the big one. Okay, so this is a very uh, general abstract form of reflection. And it turns out that uh, most large cardinals can be formulated in this way. So if you look at classes that are sigma one definable means uh, they are just definable using one existential quantifier. This is just true. This you can prove in CFC. But if you look at classes that are sigma two definable, so with two quantifiers that exist for all, then this already gives you super compact cardinal. That's equivalent. So 
the actually the least cardinal that reflects all classes of structures that are sigma to definable is precisely the least supercompact cardinal. This was proved by Magidon in 71, and I proved the same in 2012 for sigma three, and now it's an extendable cardinal, which is a slightly stronger notion, uh, and, and so on. Then you can look at sigma four, sigma five, sigma n in general, there is a whole hierarchy of large cardinals there that correspond exactly to this kind of reflection for classes of structures of a certain complexity. And the, the final theorem would be the following, that if you have this kind of structure of reflection for all definable classes of structures, this is equivalent to Lopenka's principle. This was, uh, I, well, this, uh, it's, uh, I, was show, I showed this in a certain slightly different form and then with some authors we showed what you have here. So the upshot of this is that large cardinal axioms are natural axioms of step theory because they are equivalent to natural reflection principles, in particular to this general principle of structural reflection uh, holding in the set theoretic universe. Okay, <clears throat> so let me mention just uh, a few uh, results um, that one gets by using large cardinals in different areas, okay? So the, um, the first results and actually some of the most important are the implications of the existence of large cardinals for the continuum, for the theory of the reals. So uh, it's, it's a classic result that all analytic sets of real numbers are the best measurable. This was proved by Suslin in 1917. However, if you look at the Lavesse measurability of all sigma one, two sets, sigma one, two are just continuous images of co-analytic sets. So continuous images of complements of analytic sets. Well, then for those sets to be Lavesse measurable, uh, you cannot prove this in ZFC, okay? So there are models of set theory in which this is true. There are models in which it's false. However, it is equiconsistent with CFC. But if you go one step higher, if you look at uh, continuous images of complements of sigma one, two sets, these are the sigma one, three sets, for those sets to be less measurable, uh, you need an inaccessible cardinal. So uh, if all those sets are less measurable, then the first uncountable cardinal omega one turns out to be huge turns out to be an inaccessible cardinal in L. L is the smallest inner model of set theory. That's Gödel's constructible universe. Okay. And on the other hand, uh, Soloway in 1970 produced a model of set theory using an inaccessible in which all such sets are less measurable. So the measurability of all sigma one three sets of reals is equiconsistent with the existence of an inaccessible cardinal. Uh, okay, so this is what, what Soloway proved that in the smallest model containing all the reals, then uh, if uh, that is obtained by uh, some forcing construction, forcing is this, wonderful technique for producing models of set theory in which you, you start with an inaccessible cardinal and then you collapse it. You make every cardinal below countable so that kappa belongs to, uh, uh, kappa becomes in this, in this extension, the first uncountable cardinal, namely omega one. So if once you, once you have done this and you look at the smallest model that contains all the reals, in this model, the, the reals behave wonderfully. All the sets of reals are less measurable. They have the bare property. They have perfect set property. They, they all behave like Borel sets. Of course, in this model, the axiom of choice fails because the axiom of choice implies there are anomalous or, or uh, strange sets that don't have those properties. Uh, but Perhaps the most surprising result uh, along these lines is the theorem of Shell and Wood in 1990. They showed that if there is a, a super compact cardinal, so a very large cardinal, then you cannot change the theory of the reals by 
uh, going to an extension of the universe obtained by this forcing method. Uh, so in particular, uh, using Soloway's theorem, this implies that every set of reals in L of R, in this smallest universe in which all reals exist, uh, all sets of reals behave in this very nice way. And this is just from the assumption of the existence of one large cardinal, <clears throat> sorry, of one supercompact cardinal. There is super compact cardinal, then uh, we have all these nice properties. Okay, <clears throat> see how am I doing with time? Oh, not so, not so good. Uh, well, <clears throat> there are many more results about uh, the implications of large cardinals on the theory of the reals, but I just gave you some 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 uh, small example of this. Now I'm gonna give you another small example of applications of large cardinals in category theory and algebraic topology. Here there are lots of applications. Uh, the first one uh, was proved by Isbell in 1960. So uh, in category theory, we say that the category is bounded if there is a small full subcategory that uh, so that Every object in, in, the in your initial category C is the canonical co-limit of objects in the small one, okay? That's the notion of boundedness. And Isbell proved in 1960 that the, the category set up, so it's the category of sets with the arrows reversed. This category is bounded even only if there is no proper class of measurable cardinals, okay? So you see, there's nice connection here with boundedness and non-existence of uh, large cardinals. No proper class. So there may exist measurable cardinals, but, but not the proper class of them, not many of them. Now, uh, so a category is said to be axiomatizable if it is equivalent in the, in the category sense to the category of all models of some theory and the maps are the, just the homomorphisms. Now, by the Lovenheim's column theorem of first order logic, if you have an axiomatizable theory, then this theory is bounded. That's, that's easy to see. But what about the converse? Is every bounded theory axiomatizable? Is it equivalent to the category of models of some theory? The, the arrows being the homomorphisms. Well, it turns out that <laughs> This, this, uh, you have that every bounded category is axiomatizable, even only if Popenka's principle holds. So you see, a natural notion in category theory becomes also equivalent to Popenka's principle. And there are many examples of this. There is a book by Adamic and Rosicki that you may know about. It's called Accessible, Locally Presentable and Accessible Categories, in which there are many, many examples of st um, category, category theoretic. Uh, properties or results that turn out to be equivalent to Vopenka's principle or to other large cardinal principles. Uh, in algebraic topology, there are also many applications. I'll just mention one. There's uh, something, uh, some conjecture that uh, was very famous and it was finally solved in 2005 using Vopenka's principle. So, Casa uh, Roberta, Seven Olds, and Smith in 2005 showed that if you have Bobenka's principle, then the Balsfield's conjecture is true, namely that there exist cohomological localizations on the homotopy category of spaces. Uh, this is true for for homological localizations, but for cohomo, but for cohomological localizations, this was open and finally was shown by these people that Vopenka principle implies it. And we, uh, we showed in 2015, more recently, that you don't need Vopenka's principle. If there is a proper class of super compact cardinals, then you have Bausfield's conjecture. And this was uh, kind of surprising because uh, the existence of super compact cardinals is much, much weaker uh, large cardinal than Bopenko's principle. And there are many open questions here. I mean, there are many open questions in algebraic topology, homotopy theory, homology, cohomology, and so on, that have been open for several decades. And, and they are probably <clears throat> still open because they are set theoretic. The, the question is how, how do you uh, 
a proof they are set theoretic. Yes, and the idea is uh, the difficulty is to translate those problems into a set theoretic language so that, that you can apply all the machinery of large cardinals and solve them. Uh, we were successful in this case, but um, there are still many open questions in the area. Uh, another area where large cardinals have been very useful and have solved many problems is in the billion group theory. Uh, there is a famous result of uh, EDA from 1982 uh, that I mentioned it before at the beginning of my talk, uh, which says that uh, if you look at the homomorphisms from the kappa product of the integers or reduced product, what you will find it into the integers, then there is a non-trivial homomorphism, even only if there is a measurable cardinal, because the existence of a omega one complete non-principal ultra filter on some cardinal implies that the least such cardinal has to be measurable. So the, the corollary is that the, the existence of non-trivial homomorphisms from this reduced product group into the integers is equivalent to the existence of a measurable cardinal. And the measurable cardinal is the least for one, this, the least kappa for which this holds. Um, there are other results in the billion group theory, for example, about group radicals, um, that's the, 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 if you fix an abelian group, say the integers or some other abelian group, uh, and you look at the functor that um, sends every group to intersection of all the kernels of all homomorphisms from the group A to X, this is the, it's called the radical singly generated by X. Now, um, you can also consider what, what is called the kappa radical, which is the, the, the kappa radical of a group A is just the subgroup of A generated by all the radicals, by all the, the subgroups that are the radicals uh, generated by uh, subgroups of A of size less than kappa. Now the question of whether the radical is the same as the kappa radical, this was an open question uh, that was uh, uh, solved by using large cardinals again. And the large cardinal notion here is the notion of a compact cardinal or delta compact cardinal. So if we have uh, regular and countable cardinals, delta less than or equal to kappa, uh, kappa is said to be delta compact if for any set, if you take any kappa complete filter on the set, you can extend this kappa complete filter to a delta complete ultra filter on the set. Okay, it's a, an extension of filters to ultra filters. And it said the cardinal is called compact if it is kappa compact. So every kappa compact, uh, every kappa complete filter on anything can be extended to a kappa compact ultra filter. Now it turns out that the equivalence of the radical functor with the kappa radical functor is uh, the, the equality between those two is exactly equivalent to uh, the fact that kappa is an omega one compact cardinal. So you see, this kind of, uh, uh, I think it's very nice and kind of surprising because uh, uh, a natural notion uh, in the billion group theory becomes you know, some, some natural question. Uh, it turns out that the answer is equivalent to the existence of some large cardinal. And there are many other, many other examples I could give you, but uh, there's no time. So just uh, one small sample. Okay. So I want to finish uh, the rest of my, I will devote the rest of my talk to showing you some some more recent results that um, we have obtained with some of my collaborators, uh, mostly with Menachem Magidor from Jerusalem and uh, Samuel Gomez da Silva from, from Brazil on some applications of this, precisely this kind of cardinals, this, uh, this compact and delta compact, in particular, omega-1 compact cardinals. So an omega-1 compact cardinal is a cardinal such that every 
uh, omega one complete filter on anything can be extended to an, uh, sorry, that every kappa complete filter on anything can be extended to an, an omega one complete ultra filter, okay? That's an omega one compact cardinal. Now it turns out with Magidor, we showed that these omega one compact cardinals are, are kind of uh, strange because it is consistent that the first one need not even be regular. It could be singular, which is something uh, very unexpected that, uh, that a large cardinal notion of this kind would, would not imply regularity, but it, 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 do, it doesn't imply it. So it's consistent that the first one, it's in fact a singular card. Okay, so let's, let me just go through some of these results briefly. Okay, uh, <clears throat> to um, this, the, uh, I defined what, what uh, delta compact cardinal is. Now, these cardinals can also be reformulated in terms of elementary embeddings. So kappa is delta compact, even only if for every alpha greater or equal than kappa, there is an elementary embedding from V into M, same as before, same as with measurables, with M transitive critical point. Now the critical point is not kappa, but is something greater or equal than delta, such that the embedding is definable in some way. And there is a set in M that contains the point-wise image of your ordinal that you have fixed. And in M, this D is small, it's smaller than J of kappa. This is very technical, okay? I mean, uh, it's not a natural notion, but it turns out that uh, the notion of being delta compact, which is natural in terms of combinatorics, in terms of extension of filters to ultra filters, turns out to be also equivalent to some a bit involved uh, version of uh, uh, measurability in terms of elementary metrics. Okay. Now, but the important thing about those cardinals is that they are also equivalent to some very uh, strong form of reflection in the following sense. So uh, you consider the class of formulas of second order. So the, the capital X here means second order variables, small x means first order variables. Um, in uh, where, and you consider formulas of this form. So universal, you quantify universally second order variables, you quantify existentially uh, some first order variables, and then something comes next. And what comes next is a formula in first order logic, in which you allow any, you, you allow um, uh, countable conjunctions and disjunctions, but only quantification over finite sets of variables. So this is a kind of uh, class, it's a fragment of second order logic. Now with Magnitor, we proved that a cardinal reflects this kind of formulas, even only if kappa is omega one compact. And reflex means that if you have any structure that satisfies one of those formulas, then there is a substructure of size less than kappa that also satisfies it. Okay, this, this, uh, this is what you get. And this kind of reflection gives you exactly omega one compactness. And using this, you can prove now lots of things. Uh, for example, uh, if you look at graphs and you, you um, you look at chromatic numbers for graphs. So for a given graph, uh, we say it's countably chromatic if the chromatic number is at most time zero, which means um, that there is a function. So you can paint the vertices of the graph into in countably many colors such that any two adjacent vertices get different colors. Okay, that's, that's what it means countably chromatic. So uh, we show that if kappa is omega one compact, then if you have a graph that is not countably chromatic, then there is always a subgraph of size less than kappa that is not countably chromatic, okay? And this uses this kind of reflection of this type of second order uh, formulas. Uh, here is another example. This uh, solves a very uh, long-standing question in general topology. 
So uh, recall that the topological space uh, X is called kappa Lindelof or kappa compact. If every open covering has a subcovering of cardinality less than kappa. So uh, Olive zero Lindelof is just compactness. Yes. Um, the space is called Lindelof if it is omega one Lindelof. So that's the next level. Uh, um, of course, uh, the product of Lindelof spaces need not be Lindelof, and their Sorgen, the Sorgen Frey plane is the prototypical example. But what we show with Magidor in 2014 was that uh, if that kappa is an omega one compact cardinal, if and only if every product of Lindelof spaces is kappa Lindelof. So the, the productivity number for uh, the property of being Lindelof is is exactly uh, uh, an omega one compact cardinal. Okay, so the the least omega the least omega one compact cardinal kappa is precisely uh, the 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 Lindelof uh, number for products. Okay, that that's what it says. Okay, here's another example. Uh, if Kappa is omega one compact, then for every first countable non metrizable topological space, you can always find the subspace of cardinality less than kappa that is non metrizable. Again, we have again the, this reflection phenomenon. Here's another example. If you take, uh, if you consider completely regular spaces, first countable, okay. Uh, then again, uh, we have that if kappa is omega one compact, then every first countable space that is not completely regular contains a subspace of cardinality less than kappa that is not completely regular. And one last example, if uh, kappa is the first omega one compact cardinal, then for every first countable not normal topological space, there's again a subspace of cardinality less than, than this cardinal, which is also not normal. So you see, all these are uh, standard, uh, well-known topological notions. And omega-1 compact cardinal, the first omega-1 compact cardinal is the, the, the size that gives you this kind of reflection. So if, if, if you consider first countable spaces that don't, don't have one of those properties, then there must be one subspace of size less than this cardinal that also does not have this property. Okay. Now it's completely open if the converse of any of these results uh, is true. So we do not know if, if these, any of these uh, reflection of those topological properties uh, gives you Omega one compactness. So this is completely open. We don't know. Okay, I will finish with uh, this example, which is a recent result that uh, we obtained with uh, Samuel from Mr. Silva. Um, okay, this is about something called the normal Moore space conjecture. Uh, this conjecture asserts that all normal Moore spaces are metrizable, the topological spaces in general. Now, what is a Moore space? A Moore space is a regular space that has what is called the development. This means that there is a sequence, an omega sequence, a countable sequence of open covers. So I said, if you look at any point in your space, uh, if you look at, uh, for, each for each one of the covers, you look at the neighborhoods that contain this point and take the union. Now, the set of these unions, these count only many unions, forms a local base. Okay, so, so uh, a Moore space is first countable because you have these countable local bases. Okay. Now, this problem, uh, in case you haven't heard about it, it was a very famous problem. It was probably the, the most famous problem in general topology in the 20th century. And this was finally solved in, kind of solved, in 1981 by Peter Nikos using the result of Ken Kunin. Uh, and the theorem says that if there is a compact cardinal, uh, if a compact cardinal is consistent, so if you have 
a, a model of set theory in which there is a compact cardinal, then you uh, can get a model of set theory um, in which the normal Moore space conjecture is true. So this proves the consistency of the normal Moore space conjecture. Okay, so it means that this conjecture cannot be disproved or refuted in ZFC. But surprisingly, uh, in 82, uh, Bill Fleisner uh, showed that you, you need large cardinals uh, to get the consistency of the normal Moore space conjecture. In fact, the consistency of the normal Moore space conjecture implies the consistency of measurable cardinals. So it's impossible. Um, so the, the Kuhn and Nikos um, result shows that you cannot disprove the normal Moore space conjecture, um, assuming that large cardinals are consistent. Fleissner result tells you that you cannot prove the normal Moore space conjecture without assuming the consistency of large cardinals. So it turned out that this most famous problem in general topology was completely dependent on large cardinals. Okay. So what we proved with, with my colleague, Samuel Gomez da Silva, was that uh, we improved we improved uh, the, the Kuhn and Nikos result by showing they used a, a compact cardinal and we used an omega-1 compact cardinal. So we showed that if it is consistent that there is an omega-1 compact cardinal, then it's also consistent uh, that the normal Moore space conjecture is true. Okay. Well, I mean, you may say, okay, from a compact, you go to an omega-1 compact, what's the big deal? Well, maybe it's not a big deal, but the proof actually shows quite a bit and improves quite a bit the previous, the previous results. So, uh, but then again, I mean, then again, uh, we know that the normal Moore space conjecture implies the consistency of measurable cardinals, but does it imply uh, the, the, sorry, here it should say the consistency of the existence of an omega-1 compact cardinal? Well, it's completely open. So it could be that the normal Moore space conjecture is actually equiconsistent with the existence of an omega-1 compact card, but it's still open, okay? Anyway, um, I hope I, uh, I succeeded in my goal of showing you just, maybe I went too fast, but uh, the point was to show you how large cardinals um, uh, are useful and how they appear naturally in many different contexts of mathematics and how many famous problems or uh, fundamental questions turn out to be uh, sometimes equivalent or at least that we consistent with the existence of large cardinals. And that, that's all. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you a bit. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So the consistency of ZSC can't be established within ZSC, right? I'm sorry. Can you say it again? The consistency of ZSC can't be established within ZSC, right? That's right. Yeah, that's because of oh. Gödel's incompleteness. Yes. Yeah. So, can, does there exist a large cardinal which can imply that? Yes, uh, um, if there is a weakly inaccessible cardinal, so if there is a cardinal that is, uh, let me go back to the beginning. Uh, okay, here we are. If kappa is weakly inaccessible, so if there is, if there is a regular cardinal that is bigger than omega, that is uncountable, and it's a limit cardinal so that there are unboundedly many cardinals below. So if there is such a cardinal, then uh, V, the fragment, the universe up to that cardinal, this is a model of ZFC and therefore ZFC is, co is consistent, okay? Uh, I'm sorry, I, 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 I said something wrong. Uh, um, no, not in V, but in some, in, in, some uh, in a model, in a sub-universe of V in which the, 
so, something called the generalized continuum generalized uh, continuum hypothesis holds. For example, in Gödel's constructible universe, if you if you uh, we have V, the set theoretic universe, inside it there is the smallest, the thinnest subuniverse, which is called L. That's the 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 universe of all uh, constructible sets. In this universe, the generalized continuum hypothesis holds, and in this model. Uh, a cardinal is weakly inaccessible, even only if it is strongly inaccessible or inaccessible, right? And we already saw that if we have an inaccessible kappa, then V sub kappa satisfies ZFC. So if you, if you have a weakly inaccessible cardinal in the universe and you uh, say kappa, and you look at uh, the constructible universe up to kappa, then this is a model of ZFC, okay? So if ZFC is consistent, this means there is a model of ZFC. Now inside this model, go to the constructible universe inside the model and go up to this cardinal. And this gives you a model of ZFC and therefore ZFC is consistent. That's how it goes. So if, there, if a weakly inaccessible cardinal is consistent, then so is uh, the consistent. Then you have the consistency of ZFC. So you cannot prove the consistency of a weakly inaccessible cardinal in ZFC because then you would prove the consistency of ZFC, and that's impossible by Gödel's incompleteness. Thank you. audience so are these large cardinal numbers mostly legacy or uh, other start sorry the sound is very bad i, I cannot asking, hear you well i'm asking are these large cardinal numbers that you talked about are they ZSC or are there some cardinal numbers which are not? So I cannot hear you, sorry. <laughs> so I was asking, am I audible now? Yes, now it's better, yes. <laughs> yeah, so are, are most of these large cardinal numbers uh, consistent with ZSC or? Uh, well, uh, that, that's, that's a very good question. I mean, uh, the answer is we don't know. I mean, uh, we, we, we think they are. We think they are, but as I mentioned, remember that I mentioned this Kuhn's theorem, right? That, uh, yeah, this, that um, uh, when, when Reinhardt introduced this notion of large cardinal, that there is an elementary embedding from the universe into itself, well, this was in Reinhardt's PhD thesis in 1965, and he thought, and people thought at the time that there was a reasonable large cardinal notion, but then couldn't show a few years later that this was inconsistent, and therefore uh, such cardinals cannot exist, right? Uh, it, of course, it could happen that some, some other large cardinals, I don't know, that are below like extendable or super compact or even measurable uh, in, you know, uh, tomorrow or in, in a few years time, someone proves that they lead to a contradiction and therefore they don't exist. Uh, this is conceivable, although it's very unlikely because those cardinals have been around for many years and people have used them and have worked with them and have proved theorems from them. If, they're, if, they're, if they were inconsistent, this inconsistency would have showed up already, most likely, unless there is something what we call a deep inconsistency, which uh, uh, conceivably could happen, but uh, it's very unlikely. So the answer to your question is uh, whether those large cardinals are consistent. Uh, the answer is we don't know, but we believe they are because there is a lot of evidence that they are because, uh, and the evidence is produced by using them. Uh, you use them, they are very useful, they answer questions, they, they in many cases, you, they, you are able to show the equivalence of those large cardinals with some natural mathematical statements. So imagine if 
<laughs> for example, if you could show that uh, measurable cardinals are inconsistent and therefore don't exist, well, this would also mean that many other statements in, in a billing group theory, in measure theory, and so on, that are known to be equivalent to the existence of such cardinals, they are also inconsistent. So this would produce a, a tremendous crisis in mathematics. Yes. <laughs> so, um, we, I, guess, uh, I mean, it's not inconceivable, but it's very unlikely. So. Yeah, one more thing. So in the beginning of the talk, you mentioned a lot of properties of these large cardinal numbers. I mean, mm -hmm. I didn't see a definition anywhere. Uh, so like a general definition for something being large cardinal. Number. Exactly. Yeah, very good question. Yeah. And the answer is we don't have a definition. So uh, we... So when you... Oh, oh, yeah. Yes, we, we, yes, as I, that was my first slide, remember, I, I, my first slide was precisely this, that, that, uh, well, what do we mean by large wow. cardinal? Well, we mean a, a cardinal that is uncountable, okay, and it has some properties, usually some combinatorial properties or some uh, model theoretic or logical properties that uh, implies that they have to be very, very large. And they have to be so large that when then when you look at the set theoretic universe below them, this is a model of ZFC. And therefore you cannot prove they exist because then you would be proving there is a model of ZFC. So that's the, the best I can tell you. Uh, it's true that, uh, I mean, uh, if I have to be completely honest, uh, I, uh, there is sort of a definition uh, that is not official, but and uh, a large cardinal is a strong reflection principle. And that's what I tried to explain when I talked about structural reflection. So um, there's this notion of structural reflection that uh, here, okay, that uh, this is a natural thing to assume. So that if you, if you are considering a proper class of structures, uh, any kind of mathematical structure, really, uh, algebraic structures of any sort or spaces or whatever. Okay, so, um, and it's definable in some way. So uh, then the universe of set theory is so large that it should reflect, this class should reflect in, in, the, in, the, in this sense that if you pick any, any object in this class, then there is a level such that any object in this class, there is one below that level that looks very much like it. So it's kind of a mirror effect, yes? So everything, uh, no matter how big it is, no matter how high it lives in the universe, there is always a small one here down below that looks very much like it. And uh, it turns out that all known large cardinal notions can be rephrased in this way. Thank you. Uh, I was just a 